Thank you very much. Wow. Redemption draw. Are you ready? Huh? Again, welcome to our visitors this morning. You are a blessing by being here, and it's our prayer that you are blessed by being here. Now, I've got to admit to you, church, that uh, this morning I'm going to be preaching to myself. Okay? I know no one else in the congregation needs to hear this this morning. But if you will indulge me, please be patient and let me preach to myself. Okay? The title of our talk this morning is Shine on Little Star, and it's based on our scripture reading this morning in Philippians chapter 2. I want us to take a walk down memory lane for just a moment. I want to ask you how many of you in here remember Johnny Carson? Yeah, quite a few. Well, Johnny, of course, was the host of the popular Tonight Show. Do you remember who his sidekick was? Ed McMahon, absolutely. But you see, Ed also had a program one time, and it was called Star Search. You remember it? It was sort of a forerunner to TV programs like The Voice or America's Got Talent. You know, those programs that cater to aspiring entertainers who perform before a live audience in search of stardom. In our scripture reading this morning, though, Paul picks up on a very pop popular biblical concept that you and I are lights to a dying world. Now, a few Sabbaths ago, Ricky reminded us of this in one of his sermons. And he gave us scripture like we find in John 8, 12, where it says, Jesus speaking, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. But you see, Jesus also makes a very interesting statement in Matthew 5, 14 and 16, where he says that you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and I are lights of the world. He goes on and he says that a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. But they put it on a candlestick and it gives light into all the house. And he says, let your light so shine before men that you may be seen of your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In Philippians 2.15, Paul, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, adds to this by telling us that God wants us to shine as lights in the world. But in many translations, it is translated as stars in the universe. Stars in the universe. You see, the word for light here is actually referring to heavenly luminaries, stars. How then do you and I shine as stars? How is Jesus the light of the world, but also credits you and I as being lights of the world? It's simple. You and I must reflect the one and only true light, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus in our lives. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How do we do that? How do you and I even begin the process of being lights, stars in the universe? Well, this morning we're going to go back to our scriptural reading. And we're going to look, and it's not going to give us a whole picture, but it's going to give us a little bit. Just a little bit. Help us to get going. How you and I can become stars for Christ and the universe. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your guidance, for your Lord, for your leading in your word. As we open your word, we pray for the Holy Spirit, Lord, to touch our minds and our hearts and press upon us, Lord, what you have for us to hear this morning. Father, it's all of thee and none of me. It's all about you. So I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit to impress upon our minds 
the importance of what Paul has to say for us here. We ask that you forgive us of our sins, Lord, anything that would prevent your voice from being heard. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, if you have your Bibles, now I'm kind of an old guy. I kind of like to hear the rustling of the pages of the Bible. So if you have your Bible, we're going back to Philippians chapter 2, and that's where we're going to be most of the morning. If you don't have a Bible, find one in the pew. I'm sure there's one close by. Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to start with the first part of verse 14. Are you there? Amen. All right. Paul writes under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He says to do what? All, All things without what? Complaining. Complaining, murmuring. What in the world is this? Well, murmuring or complaining is an expression of discontent. I want us to be honest. Is this a place to be honest? I think it is. You know, each and every one of us have a tendency to be negative from time to time. Certainly more than others. But we're all guilty. And to tell you and I not to complain is like telling us not to breathe. You know, sometimes we just get to a point or a situation or a circumstance that we just got to let it out, haven't we? We just got to do it. But there it is. Paul writes, do all things without murmuring, without complaining. You know, there's a story of a guy who wanted to be a monk. And he joined a monastery and he took a vow of silence and he was there for 10 years and his superior called him in and said, look, if you have something to say, you can say it as long as you just use two words. Well, the guy looked across the table at his superior and he said, bad food. <laughs> Another 10 years passed and his superior calls him in and says, look, if you like you have the opportunity to speak again as long as you just use two words. He looked across the table and he said, bed hard. Well, 10 years goes by. He gets called in again. The superior says, look, if you have anything to say, you may do so now. The monk looked across the table at him and he said, I quit. <laughs> Supervisor said, well, it doesn't surprise me. He said, all you've done is complain ever since you got here. <laughs> Aren't we a lot like that? But God instructs us here to do all things without complaining, without murmuring. How do we do it? Well, certainly by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that's the only way. But we also remember that the Bible teaches us a lot of lessons. One is, remember that grumbling or murmuring was one of the big problems of the Israelites. You know that that is what led to rebellion and that rebellion is what kept them from the promised land for 40 years. Wow. Now I want you to listen now. You may have to think about this one. When we grumble, murmur, we just may be calling God's wisdom and plans into question. Think about that a second. When you grumble, when you murmur, you might be calling God's plans into questions. Now, wait a minute. How can that be? Because, my friend, you and I don't know the future. We don't know what God has laid in store. He don't, we do not know how he has set up things to reach a certain point, to achieve a certain thing. While you and I sometimes may view as negative, in fact, God somewhere down the road has it to be a big positive. Remember that. You see, like most problems, the first step into fixing the problem is to recognizing that indeed there is a problem. And I don't want you to look around the pews. I'm not talking about everybody else. Remember the words of that that wonderful old hymn, it's not my brother nor my sister, but that stands in the, stands in the need of prayer. 
when it's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, that stands in the need of doing a little self-examination. Men? Next, we must also remember that God uses difficulty to change us. Boy, well, we don't like it. But you see, it's true. Keep your finger there in Philippians. We're coming back. But go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. James writes these words, My brethren, count it all what? Joy. Joy, when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You see, you and I may not be changed by simply looking at the fire. It may take the heat. How's gold purified? Through the heat. Now I want to ask you a question. You better think about it before you answer it. How many of you this morning would like to have more patience? Hmm? How many in here really, truly would love to have more patience? Well, a lot of you are either being scared to answer that <laughs> or you really don't want more patience. If you truly want more patience, that is your desire, then be prepared. The road may get just a little bumpy. Are you with me? So the bottom line here is that you and I must overcome the natural tendency for grumbling. We must work on our heart attitude. For out of the abundance of the heart, what happens? In the mouth, what? Speaks. You know, there was a man, his name is Victor Frank. He was a survivor of a concentration camp. And referring to our scriptural verses this morning, he had these words. Listen to what he wrote. He said, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, to choose one attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's way. You know what he was telling us? Simply put, he was saying happiness is a choice. Happiness is a choice. Do you choose to be happy? Hmm? All right, back to Philippians chapter 2. Back to our scriptural reading now. Let's go to the second part of verse 14. Paul has already told us to do all things without murmuring. Now he says to do all things without what? Disputing. What is disputing? Arguing. Thank you. Do you realize that when you argue that you are exhibiting an arrogant attitude? Hmm. Let me say that again. When you argue with someone, you are in fact exhibiting an arrogant attitude. Why? Because you're assuming that you are never wrong, that your views are always right, that you have the right answers. Hmm. Now listen up. Arguing, especially within the church, is disruptive, very rarely solves anything. You know, that may be well why Paul spends the first part of Philippians 2 talking on humility. Humility. I want you to remember, where was Paul when he wrote the book of Philippians? You remember? Hmm? Yeah, he was in prison. Paul wrote this book while he was in prison. He wrote it addressing the church at Philippi. You know, somebody once said, to dwell above with saints we love, well, that might be glory, but to live below with saints we know, now that's a different story. <laughs> Sometimes it may be. So why is it important to avoid arguing? Well, he gives us the answer in verse 15, first part. Look. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God with what? 
without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That's why. Have you ever noticed, have you ever noticed that sooner or later, sooner or later, Christians, Turks, church folks sooner fall into a category, one of maybe four? Think about it just a minute. There are those who after a while become almost like monks. They have no contact with the brother, no contact with the sister. They're sort of isolationist. Then there's another group who have lost contact with the church. They've departed from their beliefs. And they have no impact for the gospel's sake. There's another group. Oh my. Let me put my feet under here. There's another group that are church Christians only. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Church Christians only. You know for a couple hours, a few hours every week, come to church and boy, they're outstanding Christians. But the rest of the week, you know I'm pretty sure that Jesus labeled those, that group as hypocrites. Just saying. But then there's a fourth group. Those who are truly transformed and changed, who are faithful and live according to the dictates of God's Word to the best of their ability. The ones who have uh, conquered complaining, they avoid arguing the best that they can. They are the example of those identified in Philippians 2.15, who prove to be blameless and harmless. They are above, above reproach in a fallen world. It is those according to Philippians 2.13, go there if you will, that are just chock full of Christ. They are just chock full, stuffed if you will, full of Christ. Look at it. Philippians 2.13, for it is God which worketh where? In you both to what? Will and do of his good pleasure. I want you to remember something for history's sake, church. Robert Browning in the story of the Pied Piper of Hamlin, he wrote these words, And the murmuring grew to rumbling, and the rumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the house the rats came tumbling. Not a pretty picture, is it? Where does grumbling and murmuring lead to? Verse 17 and 18, Paul writes, Yea, and I, if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice, rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. What's Paul saying here? What's Paul reminding us of? What Paul is saying is he's echoing that old hymn that says, Rejoice always, and again I say what? Rejoice. Rejoice. Paul is saying that if joy and rejoicing have left your lives, then it is of utmost importance that you recover your joy. Paul, this is Paul's response. This is Paul's response to trials. Again, he wrote this from a prison cell, and yet he refuses to let his circumstances dictate his attitude. Joy, praise, they all ring out in the book of Philippians. Look over me. Keep your fingers there. And go over to chapter 4 and verse 11. Look what he says. Chapter 4, verse 11. He says, not that I speak in respect of what? Won't, for I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be what? Content. Wow. Hmm. How do we have the perspective and power to do that? How in the world can you and I be content in what every situation comes our way? Well, verse 16 of our scripture reading gives us the answer. Philippians 2, 16. 
Paul writes, holding forth what? The word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Do you sometimes feel like you have run your race and you finished dead last? Do you? Oh, Paul says, look, be content in whatever you do and the way you achieve that is to fill your minds and hearts with the word of life. That's the way you do it. Memorize verses on problems areas of your life. Claim promises offered in times of difficulty. Struggling and murmuring, arguing, is that a problem? Simply learn Philippians 2.14. That's very simple, very straightforward. Do all things without murmuring and arguing. Anybody can remember that. Then when you do, when you are confronted with that, you allow the Holy Spirit to instantly bring that to memory. And guess what? You can be content. You can be content. You can find peace in a storm. You know our culture is so negative that when it sees someone with a positive attitude, the person shines like the brightest of our stars. <coughs> Again, how many of you like to go out at night and just look up in the heavens? Hmm? You know, I used to like to do that, especially in the fall. You know, when the weather starts cooling down and a cold front comes through and kind of clears the sky, go out with a light jacket and just look at the sky. As you stare up in the sky, there are uncountless numbers of stars shining, some brighter than others, but they're all there. But you know what the most important star to you and I is, is called? called the sun. The sun. That star gives light to this planet. It brings warmth to this planet. It dispels darkness to this planet. Without it, this planet would die. It is predicted if the sun would to go out, was to go out, which is not going to happen, young people, then this planet would plunge to 400 degrees minus in temperature. Jesus said, I want you to be light, stars in the universe. Wow. How can you be sunshine in somebody's soul, huh? Oh, you can be sunshine in their soul by just having a positive attitude. By that, you can give light to them. You can bring warmth to them. You can give them a verse that will dispel darkness. A spewing church is a poor witness, a rejoicing Christian, and churches are a powerful beacon of light. Jesus says they are like a city on a hill which cannot be hidden, that can be seen from a great distance. I wonder how far our church can be seen. What kind of Christian are you? What kind of Christian am I? One who whines or one that shines? Seek to let your light shine around you. Conquer complaining. Avoid arguing. Regain joy in your life and fill your heart with God's Word. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. And I don't know how bright a star you will be. Third century man was anticipating death. He penned these words, last words, to a friend, and he wrote, he said, it's a bad world. He said, it's an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they don't care. They are masters of their own souls. They have overcome the world. These people are called Christians, and I am one of them. Shine like stars of the universe. How do you do it? How do you do it? 
It's all right there. It's all right there. To sum it up, sir, church, all we need to shine. Shine on. Every star in here, shine on. Well, that's what God instructs us to do. sing all four verses. expect everybody to leave here today and never complain about anything again. <laughs> Probably not going to happen. But we've been instructed, right? Amen. The Holy Spirit has something to work with, right? And that should be our prayer. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word and for its instruction. And Lord, I pray that what we've heard today has somehow helped us. Helped us, Lord, in our ability to shine forth to other people, reflecting your love, reflecting your word, reflecting your truth, Lord, reflecting your soon return. Father, forgive us when we fail you, but Lord, continue to grow us in your grace and knowledge is our prayer. So we thank you. We thank you for Paul's words. And Father, fill us. Fill us with your goodness and forgive us, Lord, of our sins. Now be with us until we meet again, Lord. Bless your holy name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. May God's grace come before.